Without further ado, I'd like to now introduce our presenters for today. And uh, I'm really, really pleased to introduce Jamed Fadik, who's a graphic designer and visualization professional uh, at IFPRI's visual design and production team. Um, Jamed delivered a similar webinar on this topic last year. And I have to say that the results at the Academy Week were palpable with the quality of the presentations went up significantly. And it was really exciting. And as a result of that, we introduced a a uh, most interesting or sort of uh, most exciting presentation award and uh, it was it was hardly cool. fought actually and uh, really? yeah wow. cool. it was really cool and we'll be doing that again this year. Uh, moderating today's discussion is Janet Hoda who is the communication specialist for the CGIAR research program on agriculture for nutrition and health um, and without further ado I'll hand over to you Janet. Hi everyone and thanks for joining us today. Um, as Joe mentioned, I'll be moderating today's conversation. Um, I'm just gonna take a moment and mention that this is just part of the communication support that we're offering through A&H Academy, um, both at, during the year, as Joe mentioned, but also at the uh, week, we'll be doing um, a learning lab and some other things on site to continue to support communications efforts and, um, and improvements and presentations and things like that. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, for, with any questions or for any assistance that you might need and uh, keep an eye out for that learning lab if you're gonna be joining us in Hyderabad. Um, I'm, but so that we can get right to the heart of the discussion today, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague Jamed here at IFRI and um, let him uh, talk to you about presentations. Great. Thanks so much, Janet and Joe, for having me. Very excited to be here and to, to start talking about presentations. I thought I'd turn on my webcam for a brief moment so everyone can, can see me. Uh, before I transition over to the slide. So hello everyone, I see there are about 28 of you there. Uh, nice to meet everyone. And further ado, I will sign off here on the webcam and transition over to my slides. So everyone should be, yep, seeing my title slide. So we're, uh, we're good to go. All right, well, as Joe mentioned, my name is Jamid Fallick and uh, I'm the manager here for the visual design and production team at IFPRI, uh, we do a lot of different, thing, different things on the team. We're incredibly diverse in terms of our skill set and the products that we produce. Uh, we're asked to, to help out with information graphic design, uh, infographics, conference banners, brochures, flyers, logos, research posters, and the topic of today's conversation, presentations. So how many of you attending this webinar have, uh, have gone to a conference, sat down, and had to suffer through a presentation with slides that are jam-packed with text, or complicated graphs, the font size is too small, they're hard to see. I bet a lot of you actually have been in, in that position as an audience member. Yet, when you are asked to actually give a presentation. I bet many of you, and, and me included, fall into a similar trap. So we end up delivering a presentation that looks somewhat similar to presentations we've had to suffer through. Slides with bullets and lots of text and complicated graphics and fonts that are too small. So it's not a shocker that most of the presentations given are very distracting to audiences and they result in what i like to call visual vertigo so you're trying to read a slide while someone is in front of you speaking perhaps not to those actual points themselves on the slide so you're in a position where you're trying to figure out what to do should i pay attention to the presenter should I read the slide? What, what do I do? And unfortunately, in a position like that, the opportunity is lost for a researcher to actually engage and communicate their research and have that message resonate with an audience member so that when they leave and walk out of that room, they actually remember the information that's presented to them. So I've worked on hundreds of slide decks over the past couple of years here at IFPRI. And I've noticed that there are a number of common pitfalls that could easily be avoided by researchers if they apply just a few basic design principles and techniques to their presentation. 
So that's what we're going to talk about today. Don't worry though, designers tend to uh, get really involved in color theory and semiotics and symbolism and typefaces and whether or not you should be calling it a font instead. And, and today we, we will not be getting into the weeds there. So really what this presentation is about, it's about effective communication. So simple design choices to help convey your research in clear and concise ways. If your slides are packed with bullet points and equations and graphs, your audience is gonna strain to follow you and will walk away not really understanding your research. So we don't want that to happen. But first, let me talk a bit about terminology. So you have a document, everyone knows what a document is. But have you ever heard of something called a slide unit? A slide unit is a slide in PowerPoint that's treated as a document. So there are about 75 words or more on the slide. Uh, and, and it might as well be something you print out and, and hand out to someone right, as a report. Should not exist as a slide. Now you have a teleprompter slide. And this is something that we've all seen where a slide is, is incorporating text in a way that serves as a crutch for the presenter. So the presenter is reading off the slide almost as if they were notes, right? And so the audience, again, is, is, is trying to either pay attention to the presenter or read the slides at the same time. Usually these slides have about 50 words, maybe less. So, in this case, a PowerPoint slide is being used as a teleprompter. And then you have sort of the, the, a presentation, right? And a presentation are slides that are filled with visual aids that reinforce a presenter's message. So the visual content isn't a distraction. It helps the presenter make a point, right? And bring a, a lot of visual continuity to their message. So when used in this way, an audience member will remember what you're actually saying. So well-designed, visually dynamic presentations help your colleagues, help your partners, funders, most importantly, better understand your work. Okay, think like a designer. A lot of people come to me and they ask for something to look pretty. I love making things look pretty. That's not a problem here uh, in the graphic design department. Although design is so much more than just making things look pretty. I mean, at its core, design is about solving problems in ways that are elegant, simple, and convenient. So de designers focus on experience, experience, of translating, in your case, research into a product that allows your message to be delivered in a very clear and concise, memorable and beautiful way. So for you as a presenter, I ask that you start thinking as a designer. So every decision that you make on your slide has to be intentional. Your text, the background images you use, the colors you use, the photos, the graphics, everything on your slide has to be a part of visual continuity. And we'll get into a little bit more of that, but all be used in a way to deliver your message in a much more powerful way. So think like a designer. Okay, here's an example of a slide where someone was definitely not thinking like a designer. You have, different font sizes, different colors, different font styles. The structure uh, is, is a bit hard to follow here. It, it's very confusing, right? You're trying to figure out how to decipher this information uh, and it's, it's causing a lot of confusion. And frankly, a slide like this doesn't really convey a sense of confidence in you as a, as a researcher. If a slide looks like this, what does your you know, research look like? If you can't organize a slide in a certain way, then I mean, I'm mean, i gonna assume that you might not be able to organize an Excel document the same way, right? So that's something that you definitely don't wanna impart on your 
on your audience. Here's another example. This is a uh, very extreme. Uh, in this case, I don't even know what's happening here, but it's certainly way too much for, I, I would say, even a printed document. Uh, so really, at the end of the day, how do you use PowerPoint as a tool uh, in order to ensure your research is properly communicated? So that's what we're going to focus on today. There are a number of simple techniques that you can use as soon as this webinar is over and apply them to your own slides. And we're going to go over those. A lot of a lot of people ask about fonts, so I'll get that out of the way in the beginning here. There are a lot of loaded fonts into PowerPoint. Uh, I would usually recommend using up to three, not more. And these are the recommended fonts that I suggest using for your presentations. Every font has its own personality. Arial, Gilsons, and Helvetica each, I think, bring their own uh, approach or their, their own kind of visual uh, signal to, to the font. So it's up to you. I think the, the main takeaway here is you definitely want to use a font that's already preloaded into PowerPoint. The last thing you want to do is to show up to uh, a conference, have your presentation loaded up onto a different machine, and have that machine not be loaded with the fonts that you use. All of a sudden, it's just like soup, right? It's, it's, it's uh, making a decision based on a font that it thinks it should use, and then all of the time and energy and focus that went into making your slides beautiful, you know, within seconds is is ruined. So definitely stick to the preloaded fonts uh, as uh, you know, as something you'd want to have in uh, in your slides. Okay, so today we're going to talk about three important techniques. These techniques are all organized around uh, three concepts visualization, unification, and focus. So visualize your content as much as possible. Think through how to visualize what you're talking about. You can do this through photos. You can through the, do this through data visualizations and icons. Visualizing your content is going to make your audience, help your audience understand your work, but also remember what you're saying. Unification. You want to unify all the elements of your presentation so there's a common look and feel and continuity. You can do that with color, with images, with text, with structured layout, but there has to be consistency in the way that you lay out each slide. So inconsistent design, as I was saying, gets in the way of clearly communicating your research. And lastly, you wanna focus. You're speaking to a group of people, you're trying to capture their attention. Everyone has cell phones. A lot of people are distracted or they've already had to sit through you know, a couple of different PowerPoint presentations. So this is an opportunity to try to engage with your audience as much as possible, to understand before going in to the room what, you know, who your audience is, what might be the most important messages to convey to that particular audience. Uh, and, and just keep that in the back of the mind, in the back of your mind as you're designing and structuring your presentations. So we're gonna start off with photos, which are the backbone of, I think, of every engaging presentation. Uh, the photos you use, though, have to have a purpose. They bring life to your research, but they do have to correlate to the message that you're conveying. So the photo selection has to be deliberate and has to correspond to what you're presenting. This is an example also of, a, of another way to use a photo as a background texture to bring some color and interest to a slide. In this case, I found a, a, an aerial shot with some negative space over to the right that allowed me to put down a, a text box with, with a title. So, it's always good to try to find photos that work well with text. So a, a photo that has enough space for you, if you're using it as a background to overlay uh, text onto it without getting away, getting in the way of the subject matter, uh, but also not creating a slide that's just too busy. It's just, it looks too messy. So you can start off with a simple slide like this, a title and some bullet points but then 
incorporate a photo, in this case off to the left or to the right, uh, that just brings this information alive. PowerPoint has a lot of really interesting ways to crop images once you bring them in. So you can crop a photo into a circle, or in this case, uh, a teardrop that's pulled up into the top right-hand corner. Or what you could do is you could strip that slide of the bullet points, bring those into your notes, and just have the title be the main focal point on top of uh, a background image. There are a couple of, of really good resources out there for photos if you're looking for photography online. I use visualhunt.com, which is excellent, excellent, and Flickr is also really good. What's great about Visual Hunt, once you start exploring it, is you can search on non-commercial -com photos. So these are photos that you would be allowed to use within your presentation. And then Visual Hunt provides you with uh, credit information. So you don't have to really kind of think through what that is, and you can just cut and paste that credit uh, onto your photo, just make it small and put it uh, either at the end, any acknowledgements or final slide, or on the photo itself. So you can see I did that here uh, on this title slide, the bottom right-hand corner. There I just put a, a little uh, a credit, which doesn't really get in the way, but, but it's important that you include that. So we're going to move on to icons. Just like photos, icons can be used to make your slides more engaging and, and more memorable. I mean, they allow you to help kind of connect your information to a, a visual output and then help unify that message uh, visually. So you can start off with a simple list here, but then incorporate icons in a way that is just a lot more visually engaging and interesting moving away from kind of the, the bullet approach, uh, bullet point approach. Okay, so this is uh, an overview of, uh, of my presentation. Pretty, pretty straightforward. This is taking icons and using them to build out something that's, I would, I would argue is, is much more visually interesting. So icon resources like photos, there are a lot of resources that you can uh, that you can use online. Two of my most favorite, Flat Icon and the Noun Project. These are great sites, especially if you're looking to just get some general ideas. Their search capabilities are fantastic, uh, and it's a really good starting point for a lot of conversations I have with researchers about helping them design icons. Uh, you know, you, you, you give them the ability to then search through these databases to start to come to a better understanding of, of how do you actually visualize a, a certain concept or are there, are there particular uh, ways to, uh, to use icons that really get to kind of the core of, of, what, you're, of what you're presenting. Data visualizations. So, simple fact, slides aren't the greatest for showing complex data. You're projecting a lot of information onto a slide, right? And an audience member doesn't have the ability to take that and to really get up close and personal with it and to look at it and examine that information closely. So your approach to presenting your data has to be different. So when it comes to displaying data in your presentation, I would say adhere to one major principle, and that's the principle of clarity. So it's critical that the data in your presentation has a clear message. So data slides aren't necessarily about the data, they're about the meaning of the data. So before you translate some of your research let's say out of a journal article and onto a slide, ask yourself this, what is it you want your audience to take away from your data? What's the main message that you want to communicate? That I think is an excellent question to ask yourself and will help guide you through how much of that data is translated into a graph. Okay, so let's start with this slide here. Simple line graph, we're looking at, uh, 
crop yields with and without irrigation in Malawi. It's simple, it's to the point. There are a couple things we can do here. Number one, if you notice, the legend, the color legend is crammed down like kind of the bottom of the slide and it's really hard to see. So as an audience member, you're trying to figure out, all right, I see two lines here, but what do these lines actually mean? So my recommendation is to let that legend breathe. Bring the legend up into the actual graph itself. In this case, you can add text boxes, color co coordinate them with the lines themselves, and all of a sudden you have a, a functioning legend, right? Legend might work in a paper, it might work in a handout, but that type of an approach doesn't necessarily work on a slide. Highlight what's important. So in this case, I added a light transparent green box over a certain segment of this line graph. So if I'm presenting, I want to ensure that I'm engaging the audience and focusing their attention to the key message. And in this case, the key message could be, why is, there dip, why is this dip occurring in 2004, right? So you're able to highlight what's important and use that as a way to engage your audience. A lot of the times there's a tendency to cram in a lot of information onto one slide. And my advice to you is deconstruct. So take these elements and it's okay to create three slides or four slides out of maybe one slide with a lot of information. So I'm going to deconstruct this slide for you now. You can take out the title and give it its own slide. And then what I recommend is use the entire canvas within PowerPoint for one graph. That way you can make the font sizes bigger, you can pull it out and you can maximize the real estate on that screen so the people in the audience can actually see the information. Another example of using the full canvas in PowerPoint to do that. So layering, layering is a really interesting technique. I think that'll take you far when it comes to your presentations. I'm gonna show you a couple examples of what layering actually, uh, actually looks like. So here's a slide with, uh, well, one with a legend that's I think a little bit too small uh, with a couple of lines here. So it's simple, it's to the point, there's, there's a message here, but how do you bring that message out? Well, first, we're gonna let that legend breathe so it's easier for the audience members to see. And then we're gonna use this structure of layering. Well, where you're taking one particular line, in this case, tablets, and you're graying out the other lines. So this enables you to focus the audience's attention on the message, and in this case, the message that's being delivered around tablets. So it's stripping away what's not important while also keeping that information on the, on the screen. So if you notice here, you can start out here, but then transition over as a speaker to talk about tablets, to deliver that message that you want your audience to remember about this trend. Then you can move on to laptops. So this is a, a very simple technique with layering. You can also layer process graphics. These graphics are actually quite popular. I would say 95% of the presentations I work on includes a process graphic like this. There's a lot of information, a lot of boxes, a lot of arrows. You can layer this though, as you're presenting this information to your audience. So in this case, you can highlight a box in a different color and say, okay, I'm gonna talk about capital assets first. Then you can use a slide to pull into that component of this larger process. So in this case, talking about capital assets, but I'm pulling away from the larger framework and diving in deeper, which allows me to one, use the entirety of the slide but also to increase the font sizes and, and make it a little bit more readable while not over uh, kind of uh, oversharing, right? So this helps you deliver 
your message in a much more clear way and I, I think pulls in your audience uh, and helps them focus. So I will then, right now I'm gonna move on to goods and services. I've talked about capital assets. Let's get into goods and services. So what's nice about this is that it's sort of a macro and a micro approach while using this te technique of layering to present all the information, but then to drill down on specific areas. You can apply the same technique to uh, a slide like this. So let's say you're not comfortable with just having a slide with a photo, which is perfectly fine. You could still use bullet points, but using this layering technique, you can take some uh, an audience member through your bullet points by graying out the other ones that you're not talking about. So you're taking one slide and you're making four or five of them and you're just clicking through each of these bullet points as you're speaking about them. Great example of layering, very easy to apply, and I think will get you very far uh, within your, your presentations. Header slides are, are also great. You're presenting a lot of complex information. It's a lot for an audience member to digest this, to really think it through, to follow you. So header slides are fantastic as a way to take a step back to let your audience breathe to process some information and for you to, to reset too. Okay, I've now talked about this part of my research. We're gonna transition over into part, you know, part two, act two, act three. Uh, and it's a great way again also to bring your audience members back into focusing on you and your slides. Visually interesting, there's a big photo, it's bright, it's colorful, it's allowing someone to take a breath and then to, to refocus their attention. So header slides are, are, I think, are a fantastic way to do that. This is another example of a header slide. You can alter the transparency in your background image so it's not as bright and then bring out that text on top of it. This is another example of that too. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about animations. PowerPoint has increasingly large number of ways to animate your slide decks. I would suggest not going down this rabbit hole for now. I, I think eventually once you're comfortable with your, with your presentation and really have mastered the techniques of using PowerPoint, then animations can certainly help deliver a message in a meaningful way but they are often distracting to the design process and can pull you away from really focusing on on what's the most important that's your information and conveying that in a clear way this is an example that i wanted to show you of, of an animation that i did for this presentation it took me about 35 minutes to do this so <laughs> although fun to work on they do require a lot of your time So introducing certain people, bringing them over to the right here, and then delivering a final message. Fun, really cool, but distracting. Okay, so now we did it. You did it, you're done. Congratulations. You did it, you delivered your presentation. Wow. You always see the questions at the end slide, right? Thank you, or do you have questions? I, I'm gonna be a fairly, I think, provocative here and say these are a wasted opportunity. One, they signal that your presentation is over. So someone's gonna kind of disengage, start checking their phone, they're gonna put their, you know, their computer maybe into their bag and start organizing themselves. You can kind of see a you can hear a rustling, right? Which is very distracting. You don't you don't want to do that because in a in a way, one, you don't want people to leave questions are important uh, part of, uh, of your presentation. Um, and certainly you don't want to send a, send a signal that it's over. So instead of ending on a question slide, I always like to end on a slide that communicates your core message, right? This is the point that I want you to remember before you leave and after you leave, if you think about this presentation, 
right? Remember, remember this. So it's an opportunity to, to, to end on this note. You can end on the note, you can deliver your core message, and then you can say, that, you know, thank you very much for having me. It's been delightful to present to everyone online. Now is an opportunity for, uh, for us to take some questions, right? questions in the audience. So in this case, I'm ending on uh, what I started with uh, around kind of three simple ap approaches to organizing your information and helping you deliver more pow powerful presentations visualize your con con visualize your content harness the power of icons data visualizations and, and photos unify your slides using consistency a structure that follows logic and reason that's using the same colors image you know image types text structured layout etc and then focus through the use of layering and heading you can actually draw your audience back into your presentation as you move through uh, different aspects of, of your research. So with that, now we can take some questions. All right, thank so you, Jamin. Thank you. And um, I'm gonna kick off our question session um, with a few that have come in during the course of your presentation. Um, though definitely folks think about what questions you might have and you're welcome to either type them into the question box or raise your hand and we can call on you as, um, as, as those come in. Um, so we had a couple of questions actually um, about the photos okay. and um, specifically about um, photos that you might take during your research. Okay. Okay. So first of all, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the benefits of taking them yourself versus relying on stock photos later and sort of having those available to you. Okay. Um, but then also, how would you cite those? Would you just cite yourself? And what kind of ethical considerations um, come up regarding consent and things like that? Okay. That's that's. Those are you know the photos are definitely something that um, you know that that people um, you know I think are really concerned about because and definitely um, with recent um, privacy issues you know sure. the whole consent thing has become I think a much more hot button topic. So. So with consent, if we could start with that. If you are in, in the field and you have your camera and you want to take pictures of people that you're working with, you should always ask their permission. And if possible, present them with information on how that photo will be used, where you might want to use it. So I think that is enough for you to engage in a conversation with the people you're photographing to then either have the permission to take their photo or not, But but you always, I feel should should ask. Yes, and you probably, I'll jump in there for yeah. a second too, because you probably should check with your own communications departments because institutions will have their own, you know, they might have specific recommendations for you to follow that, um, you know, guidelines and things like that to exactly. help you go through that process. Yeah, yeah, so I think that's a, also a really good suggestion. You should always reach back to your communications team uh, for information, they might have a policy in, in place that you could follow. Right. But I, I do I, I do like the idea of using your own photography. Stock imagery can tend tends to be a little um, sanitized, mm. maybe. Yeah. And, and sometimes could look a bit too polished or commercial. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're the one in the field taking the photos, there's an authenticity mm -hmm. to that imagery that I, I do think is very important for you to have as a part of your of your research. And also too, you're gonna know what to take a photo of, mm, right? That's true. If you're studying a certain aspect of agricultural production, you're gonna get photos that are very specific to your research, which are, are often harder to find, yeah. right? Through a stock library or, for, or on Flickr or Visual Hunt. So certainly I think it's always a good idea uh, if there is an opportunity to do that, to, to use your own imagery. In your presentations, it's okay. For printed products, they require higher resolution photographs. So that's when I would say it's less of an opportunity perhaps to use your, your own imagery. But for presentations, certainly that's a, a great, I think a, a, a great approach. Okay, all right. Um, do you have any recommendations for websites or resources for getting templates for slides? There are a few out there. 
and perhaps at the after I um, we conclude the webinar, I can add some of those links to the presentation. There you go. And then so when people go to A and H Academy's website later, they'll yeah. be able to find those at the end of the presentation. Yeah, they're they're templates. They're also templates within PowerPoint that you can use that that aren't that bad. Hmm. Yeah. I would suggest though first asking the your organization or um, group that you're a part of if there are any branding requirements mm -hmm. related to your slides or logo usage, usage etc. Yeah, so that's, a good that's point. always important to, to check out first. Uh, in the case of a &H Academy, do you, I'm looking at Joe, do you have a, a template that you provide your researchers to, to use with branding for the event? Um, so for the event, present like oral presenters and poster presenters can Bring their own templates to present it on that. Okay. We'll have a title slide at the beginning. They will have their name on it and the name of their presentation anyway. So they don't need to add any of any of the branding for the academy in the event. Okay. So they might want to, but they, that that still means they might want to consider their own, like as you say, organizational branding. Right. And stuff. Okay. Sure. Um, okay. I'm so glad somebody asked this question because I think it's probably on everybody's mind. Um, is there a special way to present equations? A special way. A spe any, any particular suggestions or, you know, I think as communications folks, we really struggle with this because I think our instinct yeah. is to say, don't present the equations. But from the research perspective, sometimes people feel they're very important to show sort of how they've come right. to where they are. So what's I, your thought Yeah, on that? I would say use, if possible, the entirety of the slide mm. in which to showcase the equation. Okay, so don't try to put anything else in with it. Just let it stand. I, I think if that is, if, if you're talking about the your methodology, your approach, and the equation is an important aspect of that, mm -hmm. then yes, I, I would say have a slide just with that, so people can see it in the back of the room. They're not squinting. Uh, you know, they're not struggling to understand what you're saying. And then, you know, with an equation, I, I think you could treat it uh, with a, a layering technique, perhaps, if you want to talk through the equation. Mm -hmm. You know, you could use highlight boxes or, you know, perhaps arrows that, you know, talk about a particular aspect of that equation and kind of move through it in mm -hmm. a systematic way with creating some nice, like, visual cues mm -hmm. for an audience member to help, um, you know, understand. Mm -hmm. Your, your message. Okay. Um, all right, that's good to, and I think that that builds actually on some, uh, a couple of the next questions that I'm seeing going back to animations. And I think people are really hearing what you're saying about that being kind of a, a risk. It's a bit of a risk. It's a bit of a risk, but there's a couple of things that have come up um, specific to that that I think are, are really worth addressing. And one of these things is when you have something where you're trying to show the evolution of something over time, Right. how do you do that? And if you're not using an animation, is there a way you'd suggest that? And the other part is, going back to our NH Academy guidelines on the number of slides, what do you do when breaking one of these slides down into several pieces rather than animating it sort of puts you in a tricky spot yeah. with the, the slide cap? That's true. That's a, that's a good question. I would say with animations, you just have to figure out what makes sense. If, if you're, you know, the, the scenario in which you're describing, Janet, it, it sounds like it's a good opportunity to perhaps use uh, some of these uh, animation functions in PowerPoint. M my advice to you is to really uh, to to really focus on how those animations help you deliver your message, and then to practice practice mm. and understand how those animations work. Okay. Because a lot of the time you you tend to forget how the animations work in your presentation. Mm. So you're kind of click, you're up there, you're clicking through, right? Well, wait a minute, that's, and you, you know, you're, you're having to figure out everything in front of an audience. So right. I, I would say if there are animations, practice them uh, on your computer and really understand how everything works. Okay. So that when you're delivering um, your slides, it doesn't get in the way of uh, your ability to communicate Okay. Yeah, with uh, with the number of slides, so it, it's a it's tricky. It's definitely tricky. I always say it's it's not it's really not the number of slides. You shouldn't worry about the number of slides. 
but you actually do because in submitting them to uh, to to Joe, and in this case, there's there's a maximum number. So when they, so I have a question for you, Joe. When people submit their presentations, are these the presentations that will be loaded up onto the machines uh, at the conference? Yeah, they are. Okay. Twitter. Yeah. So basically, what? Because uh, Reshma, I see your question. It's a good question. I think, especially in light of what we've learned today, and so I guess to say is the the although the the guidance for the oral presenters is largely quite strict, especially where the time limit is concerned, the ten minutes, the guidance on the number of slides is really more of a kind of guide to sort of because when we look back, often one of the things we see is that people come sometimes come with maybe. 70 slides or something to get mm -hmm. through in 10 minutes and it's just a disaster because you can't get through that and it's just right. so what we did is we just did a sort of rough back of the envelope calculation about you know 16 slides 10 minutes that's around about 37 seconds on each slide but that doesn't mean to say that you can't break those slides out and present them in a more interesting way and we'd be very pro okay you being flexible with that if it's going to make your presentation more uh, easier to communicate great so don't be shackled by the number of slides so much as using that as maybe a guide for how long you might want to spend on each piece of mm -hmm. element of your research I'd yeah say. and yeah. i would have to say that also from a communication standpoint i would love to see something that maybe went five or ten slides over the recommended number if it was accompanied by a note that said rather than including an animation i broke one of my slides down into a certain number of them and that's why this looks like it's more than it is. Yeah. Because then I know, first of all, that we're, we're, somebody has taken the time to think through, I don't wanna get into a situation where I'm, I'm stuck and there's something going wrong with the presentation. I've taken a simpler approach right. and this is, this is what's happening. Yeah. So I think that, that you know, as sort of organizers, we tend to be a little bit more, we, we tend to really be you know, excited to see those things happening. Yeah. <laughs> May I ask about the, the machines and whether or not they come preloaded because I've, I've heard of situations where you can submit a presentation that's printed that might be different from the one that you actually present oh uh, no so this is where it, it were quite this is one area where we do have to be quite strict because of the volume of presentations we have and because also we want to test the presentations that are compatible with the machines and often if there's heavy images and stuff it can be it can they can be a bit slower mm. so um we do ask that the, your final presentation is submitted in this case it needs to be with us by sunday the 23rd of june so that's the, right the week before the, okay. the sunday before the event and that gives us the opportunity and that has to be the final one um and in any case i suppose it's probably good that you've got it wrapped up by then that's true anyway having say. that deadline yeah can we talk for a moment about that because i feel like sometimes again as organizers and communications folks we get sort of a um we get it, it, people take it as we're trying to be difficult about it when we put these deadlines in, but there's a real benefit to presenters from sort of having that done ahead of time, you know, because then you're able to kind of, to, you know, uh, it's done. You're not scrambling at the last minute and winding up with mistakes or different versions of it um, submitted. So, um, you know, I think that that's, it's that's giving helpful. you the chance to work out any bugs and things like that. Right. So please, if you're looking at that deadline as a, a negative, there are positives to it too. <laughs> okay, back to some of our questions. Um, um, somebody has a question about um, using some, the the last slide that you've got up right now. Um, you know, terms of like the uh, key terms of their object objectives um, is you know putting together a slide like that. Is that something like a, a design and a, a setup in terms of those key kinds of terms that you'd recommend from a research perspective also? you know, just the way that you've set that up. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, a good exercise is uh, as a way to deconstruct your slides. So, you know, you can start off with um, a slide maybe that has five bullet points and then focus on each of those points on the, the, key, the key word or the critical message and strip away all the other words that don't get you to that point. Okay. So in this case, I'm using visual, visualize, unify, and, and focus. I could have easily have created a, a, a slide with text that describes those. But what I did is I pulled that information out of the slide, put it into my notes section, 
and really focused on, on the key words that I wanted to use in presenting this material. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Um, I think that we have a hand raised. Yeah. Are we I'm able late. to? I can unmute. Um, let's talk for a minute about the way you can use sort of notes in your presentation. You know, we've, we've spent some time, you spent some time specifically talking about moving away from using your presentation as your note cards. Right. So, um, how would you recommend people, um, you know, make those notes available to themselves and, and are there things that, um, that they should incorporate into those in okay. a way that would make that easier to walk through? Right. So I exited presentation mode so I can show you my desktop where I've put my notes for this presentation. So I've used the note function here to script out what I delivered, pulled it out of the slides when possible, and then you can print out mm. your slide deck that incorporates those notes. So you can have something tangible in your hands right? Mm -hmm. That allows you to go over the script if you're not comfortable delivering it without any, um, you know, uh, any um, grounding. Okay. So I think that's a really good idea. You could take those notes out of PowerPoint and create note cards and have those as a way to move through your presentation and for you to script things out and for you to, to try as much, much as possible to memorize mm -hmm. those notes. Also, when presenting, you can't see it here, but often you're able to, let me see if I'm able to show it. I'm sure you've noticed this where when you enter presentation mode, maybe not, uh, the machine in which you're presenting on projects your slides for the audience, but then displays another screen for you on your computer that only you could see. Mm. And it's a dashboard of sorts that provides you with your notes mm -hmm. in front of you. So in a way it's acting like, um, almost like a teleprompter, okay. but it, it's allowing you to read through those notes, having them in front of you without the rest of the audience actually seeing that information. Okay. And that's something that I would say you'd have to practice using. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to get comfortable with uh, with the interface. Okay, but then you should also have a backup with you too, right? Like you would, you know, it's, I think it's always worth having a copy of those notes, a hard copy, just in case something is not working with the technology when you get up there. Definitely. Because whatever you can do to prepare yourself for those kinds of things that might go wrong at the last minute, the more smooth your presentation is gonna be. Absolutely. Okay, so I have another question come through, and please, folks, keep those coming. We can stay a few minutes yeah. past our uh, one hour mark, so if you've got more questions, we'd love to hear them. Um, I do have a question from someone about how many, is you know, how often would you recommend using photos? Is this the kind of thing you want to incorporate on every slide? Is it something that you'd want to use maybe every few slides? You know, what, what's the balance there? I think balance is the key word. Oh, okay. <laughs> so try to find balance and, in your use of, of photography, uh, definitely don't rely on it too much. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's always good to to include images throughout your presentation. So just kind of figure out where they mo may, make the most sense. Okay. And and how to how to use them. I mean, I've seen some slides with with just a photo without anything else hmm. mm -hmm. and I think those are, are quite effective mm -hmm. uh, if used appropriately but in that case that image you're presenting has to be a component to the message in which you're delivering to your audience okay so you have to think about how those go together exactly and, okay yeah. okay um, and then going back for a minute to you know, tips for presenters in general, sort of going beyond just putting your slides together. What are the things you'd recommend for people as they're, as they're preparing for something like this? You know, you've got your slides, you've turned them in early, what do you do now? 
practice. <laughs> <laughs> Stand in front of a mirror or, you know, find an empty room mm -hmm. with a podium mm -hmm. and, you know, bring your note cards uh, with you. Time yourself. Time yourself. The whole way through. The whole way through. Definitely. So not just the beginning. No. <laughs> <laughs> but to the very ends. I think there's a tendency for a lot of us, me included, to really focus on those first few slides, mm -hmm. but then, then to get distracted and to kind of give up. Uh, and so the middle to end of, of your presentation isn't, you know, as um, succinct or finely tuned as the beginning. Okay. So, and then that's an easy way to lose time. Because it's an easy you're kind way. Of wandering right. a little bit, and then all of a sudden you've gone over right. time. Yeah, and and, it, and it, it's there's nothing worse than having someone realize <laughs> that they've run out of time. You know, there there might be some people in the back of the room holding up like a red card, and so you're trapped in this situation, and you're literally clicking through slides like the 10 other slides that you haven't delivered and rushing through that information. So you definitely don't want to be in that, uh, that boat. All right. So I think practicing timing it is critical. Okay. And also I think it's helpful to put into those notes sort of some visual cues for yourself. Um, yeah. You know, I think sort of a, an, I do this when I'm putting together a presentation, I'll write into my own notes, breathe. Right. or something like that so that I remind myself to kind of take a moment and break it up a little bit because the, not only do I need it but the audience needs it right you know so you had those slides in there where you're giving the audience a little bit of a break but you need to kind of make sure that you're providing yourself that also yeah I mean th those slides are quite functional for the audience but also for you there you right? go to, to reset to mm -hmm. to take a step back and to breathe yeah to maybe have an opportunity to look at down at your notes very quickly and then to, to transition into the next portion or act two of your presentation. All right. Okay, well, I think we have come up on our time. So if there are any other points that, that Jamet or Joe you'd like to add in before we close? No, I think that's absolutely great. I've really enjoyed that and I've learned a lot myself, actually. I can't wait to check out the layering function. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thanks so much, Jamet and Janet. For yeah, thank you for having me. And um, we're looking forward to seeing many of you in Hyderabad. And if you have questions as you're putting things together, don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, you can send anything to the ANH Academy inbox and we'll get back to you. Even if you want some more tips, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, if you want to send your presentation and have a little bit of feedback, that's yeah, fine. Definitely. We're happy to do that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Catch you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.